Hi everyone, my name is Iyad Murtada. On behalf of the IMA Dubai chapter, I would like to welcome you all here today to our uh, first webinar for this year. Uh, as for myself, uh, I run uh, a company here in Dubai called Open Thinking, and we deliver different kind of training related to finance and accounting and auditing. And at the same time, I work with the IMA here uh, on, uh, as a like a VB for CMA on the board of directors. And today also here with the webinar, we have with us uh, uh, Mr. Karim, he is the president of the IMA Dubai chapter. So this webinar is related to financial intelligence. And when we think about financial intelligence, when we think about you know, what kind of skills for us that we need to have when we are reviewing the financial statement, when we are making financial decisions that will help us in really you know, understanding our work in improving our decision making. So the, these are really critical things that we need to consider when we are trying to analyze financial statement or making financial decisions. So this training is based on this great book, which is called Financial Intelligence. And this book is uh, one of the best sellers by Harvard Business School. Uh, you can find it in Kinokinia uh, if you would like to buy it in Dubai. So the main idea of this book was trying to make you understand that financial information or financial numbers will not give you, you know, will not give you enough information. What you need to do, you need to go beyond the numbers. You need to try to understand something more than just reviewing the financial numbers in, in front of you. So let me start by asking you this question. Why do smart managers make bad financial decisions? So please you use the chat box to answer. Why do you think, you know, smart managers, maybe even we can say smart financial managers make bad financial decisions? What do you think the answer? So I see many of you are typing. This session should be interactive. So this is the main purpose of it. Because they are influenced by external factors. Yes. So maybe they are not really independent. They are influenced by external factors or they are looking at so much information. Maybe they don't have enough information. So, so see, there are so many things that they need to take a look at when they are trying to analyze this information. Maybe it's not accurate information. Yes, maybe they, uh, do you know, uh, like you said, they have misled, uh, misleading information. Maybe the wrongs are number are wrong. Maybe they don't understand how to read the numbers. So there are many factors. But let me summarize all this by one thing. You know, when managers are making decisions, they are using their minds. And when they are using their mind, if there is something wrong with the way that they are looking at the information, the way that they are processing the information, connecting the information, this is going to result of an issue, other than all these external factors. So let's go inside our minds. So when we look inside our minds, we can see that there are two parts. We have the emotional intelligence part, and we have, you know, let's say the, the operational intelligence part. So emotional intelligence, when we are making financial decisions, Focus here. Do we have, you know, the uh, skills for us to be able to manage ourselves, our emotions? So if you are angry, if you are frustrated, if you don't know what to do with, the, with your emotions, you will not be able to do the right financial decision. At the same time, if you don't handle others when you are trying to work with them to obtain information, to, uh, to be able to analyze some of these financial data, you will not be able to do the right decision because they are not going to cooperate for you. But today our topic is not related to emotional intelligence. Today we are focusing on financial intelligence. And for financial intelligence, what are we trying to do here? We are trying to say, do you have, you know, this intelligence for you to be able to make the right uh, financial decision based on the information in front of you? So here we can go deep inside our mind and we can see how do we really, you know, process information. So we can say the following. The first thing we obtain information. So every time you see something, you just, you know, you collect this information. You collect all the information from everywhere. After that, you process the information. So, so you process all this information inside your mind, and then you store it, right? You have your neuro cells that where you store all the information in the cells inside your mind. And then what will happen? When you need this information, you go and connect this information together. So you say, okay, this is the information from here, this is the information from here, and you collect all this information together for you to be able to make a decision. So this is the process. And if there is anything related to obtaining the wrong information or processing the information in the wrong way or not storing the right information or not connecting the information in the right way, you will make a wrong decision. 
So let's start by saying something like this. These are financial numbers. What do you think these are fin uh, numbers, uh, numbers for? Maybe it's for balance sheet, income statement, maybe this is cash, maybe this is just representing, you know, some internal report. So we don't know. It's just financial numbers. We, we call them data. So they are not giving us anything other than data. When we define them, when we say what these financial numbers are for, now we convert them from financial numbers into financial information. See, which is really critical, that we are confirming, uh, uh, taking the financial numbers and making them financial information. And then when we con connect these informations together, we will be able to turn them into financial knowledge. So financial information is great, but when we connect them together, we'll be able to understand how much net margin are we getting from our uh, you know, sales? How much operating, uh, operating margin are we getting? So in that way, we'll be able to do more analysis and, and ma make much better decisions. So we can say something like this. When you have data, you know nothing. You don't have idea about what's happening. But when you have information, you know what? You know what is our income statement saying? Because you have all the information related to it. You say, what is our financial position? Now, when you know, when you convert them into knowledge and you get percentages, you connect them with them, you get some financial ratios, you will be able to know how. Now, how are you going to you know, use this information for you to be able to decide if you are going to give a loan to this company or not? And after that, when you move to the wisdom, you know, you will know why. You will know, why am I looking at this financial statement? Why am I doing this analysis? Why am I connecting this information together? In finance and accounting, they always focus, you know, they always tell you that you need to know how. You need to know how to conduct budgeting. You need to know how to do pricing. You need to do how to do, you know, all these financial accounting managerial things. But I will always tell you that if you always know how to do how, you will always have a job, you know? Everyone will hire you because you are expert. But you will always find your boss, the person who's gonna say, I know why. So the fo focus for you, you need to be able to move to the senior level by understanding not just how, but understanding why. Why, why are we doing these reports? Why are we doing them in this way? What kind of information are we trying to get from them? It's not just doing them and just give them to your supervisor. So this is really important for you to have this financial intelligence. At the same time, they mention most of the time that we use just what? 10% of our mind, right? And that's correct. Because what will happen? Think about your work. When you are creating financial report, you spend 40% 40 40 of your time collecting data. You collect the information from this report, that report, you get some uh, internal records, and you are putting all these uh, all these data together, and after that, you turn them to information. So after you collect you know, all the balances from different sheets, you say, okay, this is our cash balance. This is our sales balance. So now you turn them into information. And you spend another 20% of your time, you know what, connecting them together, saying, okay, it looks like cash representing 20% of our total assets, looks like our uh, net income is just representing 30% as a return of investment for our operation. So you say, okay. Then at the end, you have the financial report. So what will happen? They will say, okay, now we need to spend 10% of our time making decisions based on this financial report. Or 10% of our time looking at this financial report and saying, okay, what are we going to do with it? So for you, you need to focus more on knowledge and wisdom, which is processing this information and converting them into knowledge and at the same time using these informations to make decisions making rather than just you know observation and collection of data and processing of information itself and you'll be like how can i do this do you know as an accountant i need to be putting my hands in all these information and collecting them i say use technology please use technology when you use technology you will be able to take all this information in an easy simple way and you will not waste so much time on them so the idea here, you know, that finance is an art. And you'll be like, finance is an art? You know, no one was teaching me art. Yes. When you are working in the accounting field, you need to be, you know, understanding how to make judgment. And sometimes they say for accountants, that accountants who are trying to play and manipulate the financial statements, they are super creative. You know, they are artists. And because sometimes they are not creative enough, what will happen to them? They end up in jail like this guy. Because in finance and accounting you are always making judgment decisions and for that you need to be always using your mind to be able to think about okay how i'm going to report this how i am going to record this 
and this is really essential so let's start by saying okay are you good with numbers right so here's the question for you are you good with numbers because some people will say yes we are good with numbers some people will say no we are not really good with numbers so i'm gonna give you here a very simple question and i want to see if you will be able to do the calculation for it in the right way and tell me what is the answer and here i'm gonna open a ball for you just remember for you to get the cbe credits what you need to do you need to be able to go and answer at least four out of our five questions for you to be uh, to, to say that you attended the whole webinar so let me open here uh, the answers for you and i'm just gonna in a second open the question for you so you'll be able don't answer yet we didn't open anything so uh, let me uh, open the question so here is the question we are saying a bat and a ball cost 108 in total the bat costs 100 more than the ball how much does the ball cost so this is a very simple and nice question so what do you think the answer is Uh, sorry, just a second. Let me reduce this so you'll be able to do it much better. So here's you have it. Please don't write the answer. Please don't write the answer. I'm going to take the chat out. What you need to do, you need to vote. Vote the answer. Don't write it. So please just vote. Tell me what do you think the answer is. So we have a lot of people are voting. Uh, there is no button for to submit. I'm just gonna, you know, I'm just gonna open it a little bit so that way everyone will be able to see. And here I'm gonna open it on the other side. So just please answer this question. What do you think is the answer? You don't have to sub. There is no thing to submit. You just uh, click on whatever answer you think it's appropriate. Okay. So it looks like most of you answered this. So let's see the result. I'm really interested in, in looking at your results. And here we are going to view the results. Uh, just a second. Uh, so I'm going to open it again for you to vote because it looks many of you were voting in the right answer. So just vote. What do you think is the answer? Okay, let me show you now the results. Okay, and we if we broadcast the result, it looks like you know most of you said it's eight. Okay, I I, I don't want to uh, you know worry so much about your answers because I'm gonna answer it myself. And we are saying that you are financial professionals. You have been working for a long time, so let's see what is the correct answer. So if we say something like this, you know the bat is x and the ball is y. X plus y equals 108, and y x plus y is 100. So in that way, 100 plus y, which is if we take, you know, y to the other side and we say x equals 100 minus y. So 100 plus y plus y equals 108. So the answer will be 4. How many of you got it right? Here's the question, you know. How many of you got it right? It looks like, you know, we don't have more than just 14% of you got it right. And 81% of you got it wrong. And the question why? Why, when we are giving you a very simple question related to, do you know, the bat and the ball, they cost 108, and it's as simple as that. You know, the ball will cost 4, and the bat will cost 104. So the difference between them is 100, and both of them, they are 108. So why in a situation like this, do you know, we answer them completely wrong? Because most of you didn't use technology. And you'll be like, okay, what do you mean by technology? You know, technology is as simple as that, using a calculator, using a pen and pencil. Don't do the calculation in your mind. When you look at something like this and you do the calculation in your mind, what will happen that you say, okay, this is how much a bat and ball will cost. And for that, do you know, we think that it's eight. Why? Because we said, okay, the difference between them 100 and this is 108, so this should be an eight. But remember, in this question, we are not saying, do you know, the, uh, the other item will cost zero. 
We are saying you need to just as simple as put, put it in equation and answer it and get the answer. Don't try to waste so much time doing the calculation in your head. Perfect. Let's move on. So what we are saying here, people who are not able to deal with numbers, we call them innumeracy. Do you know? Like any person who can't write and uh, read. So if you can't write and read in, in that way, you, you, you need to re learn that. And at the same time, dealing with numbers is a skill that you can learn. And you'll be like, what do you mean a skill that I can learn? Is, this, is there something called like dealing with number skills? I say, yes. Some people, they don't have an idea about financial accounting. They have no idea about finance, about uh, anything related to business. But they are good with numbers. And for that, they can make a lot of money. Let me give you an example. Think about this guy. This guy, he just started in this company. He got no idea about anything in this company. What he he's doing, he is trying to get investors to invest with him in the stock market. He got no idea about the stock market, no idea about anything related to sales or marketing. He's just good in numbers. So what he did, he said, I have 800 prospective customers. I'm going to call 400 of them, say the market will go up, and call 400 of them saying the market will go down. So he did. And after that, what happened? The market went up. So he said, perfect. These people who I said the market will go down, they think I'm lying. So I'm just going to ignore them. I'm going to call the other 400 that I said the market will go up. And what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell them the market will go up for 200 of them. The market will go down for 200 of them. And after that, the market will go down. So I say, OK, so I still have another 200. I will call them. I will do the same thing. I will tell them the market will go up. The market will go down for half and half. And after that, the market will go up. Then I will call the 100 people that I called for the last three days and I said the market will go up or down and they uh, think that I know the market because it happened exactly like I said and I'm going to tell them to invest me with me. And now I acquired 100 customers just by playing with the numbers. So the idea here, you in your business, you want to understand what's happening with the numbers. Is someone in your department playing the game of numbers with financial information, with non-financial information? They are trying to trick you by uh, speaking about numbers. So this is one of the issues. Now we move. What about if I tell you, look, this is the performance of our profit. What do you think about our profit for this quarter? Our profit increased by about $10 million. Look at this. Look at this chart. Our profit increased by $10 million. Please, using the chat box. What do you think about it? If I'm telling you, look, our profit increased by $10 million, and here is the chart showing how much increase we had. What kind of questions are you going to ask me? What kind of challenges are you going to have to tell me, OK, well, I maybe, you know, uh, I need more information. What kind of information you are going to need to say, this is a really good increase? Are you going to give me a bonus, for example? What is the data in the X and Y? Yes, I'm saying the data in, um, in uh, this is just representing over time the increase in my profit. I'm just showing you a, a, a chart representing the increase in my profit over time. It's about 10 million. I'm telling you 10 million increase in my profit over time. I'm just showing you a chart. Yeah, it's a quarterly performance. Let's say it's a quarterly performance. So what are we going to say? Yeah, I'm just showing you a chart telling you how much we increase in profit. And I'm telling you it's about $10 million. It's a, it's a, it's a verbal presentation. OK, so now we get some answers. Compare it with other companies in this industry. Exactly, you know, you don't take something for granted. When you are conducting your work, sometimes someone will say, OK, here is a financial report. Look, this is how much we have in a profit for this quarter. Here is some um, cost report. Look, this is how the cost of our item. Don't take it for granted. What you need to do, you need to go and compare it. Because look what, what happened. When you look at it over a period of time, you discover that last year, we had about 100 million increase in our total profit. For this quarter, we had just 10, 10 million. So it doesn't look like in the first quarter we are doing a great job by looking just at you know, the charts. So even if someone will give you a very minimum information without X's, Y's, without numbers, and they are just showing you, you know, this is the purpose for them. They are hiding the information. They don't want to tell you what is X, what Y. They are just showing you a chart showing improvement, saying this is our numbers improved. And what you need to do, you need to say, okay, please show me the big picture. I want to see how much uh, our company compared to other companies, how much our company increased over time. So just try to understand always 
by looking at the big picture. At the same time, numbers tell a story. So in that way, if we reward our accounting uh, firms for lying, wonder thing will happen. So and, and what we are saying, you know, be careful in your accounting and finance department if you are rewarding the CFO, if you are rewarding the financial executives based on the financial performance, they are going to definitely try to manipulate the financial numbers and the accounting processes so in that way the financial numbers will appear much better. So in that way they will get their bonuses, they will get increase in their compensation. So be careful here when we are speaking about you know, financial numbers and rewards. Now we moved from financial numbers and financial data to financial information. So the first question, if I would like to ask you, and you can write in the chat box, how can we evaluate a company? If we are looking at a company and we are trying to do evaluation for it, how can we value a company? If you say, I would like really to value a company, let's say something like Ahmar Group or something like Dubai Mall, I would like to value this company to see if an investor would like to buy it. Or something like uh, Gonapit. You know, recently Gonapit was bought by Living Social. So how Living Social was creating a value for Gonapit, what do you think is the answer? For us as financial professionals, okay. We have answers based on the financial and non-financial data. Okay, I need something more. Check uh, future cash flow. Yes, so future cash flow. I want to see, for example, like Gonapit, how much Gonapit was was gonna generate is going to generate in the future for the coming, let's say, five, ten years, whatever I I decide to do. And based on it, I discount all this amount based on the infl inflation, and I say this is the appropriate amount. So this is the main concept. Do you know? I will discount future cash flow. This is one of the methods. The other one is stock value. So I would say, like here, the share price multiplied by the number of shares. So I will get the market capitalization value of the firm. Or like I said before, it's the present value of future cash flow. So there are so many things that I can do for me to do valuation. But the question here, in 2000, did we do that in 2000? Do you remember what happened in 2000? When all these financial firms coming to the market, and they, these financial firms, they, they represent, you know, like Amazon, Yahoo, all these dot-com companies, they ignored, you know, they ignored this valuation. And what happened, they say a company without a record, without even a location yet, they are just gonna about to start selling books over the internet or selling, let's say, you know, computers over the internet or services over the internet. We are gonna value these companies for billion of dollars because we believe it's gonna generate all this income. But actually, we can't for sure say about anything about this future cash flow because we don't have any past experience. We didn't do our due diligence when we were doing this. So just remember what happened in 2000 and 2001 and how all these dot-com companies collapsed because the value for them was crazy. Compared, you know, they don't have any assets. They don't have any you know, operation. They don't have any customers yet. And even that, we sold them in the stock market for thousands of dollars. So, just be careful when every time you are applying any financial principle and the market is just moving crazy, applying completely different valuation, that you should really stick to the basic. You should understand that, you know, when you are doing finance, finance based on certain principles and application. And these principles will not change if something crazy happened like the internet. Now, at the same time, having more information is not always better. Sometimes, you know, as financial professionals, we say we, we would like to get so many information. We would like to obtain all of this information so in that way we'll be able to do the right decision. I don't have enough information for my decision. But sometimes when we are getting all this information, we are clouding our judgment, right? When we are trying to make the decision, we have so many information to look at and analyze. So in that way, we lose control. We lose focus on the important information. So we make the wrong decision. So please be careful. When you are trying to make decision, try to understand which information is relevant and which information are not, and in that we focus on the important information. How nice for a company to turn the financial information into financial knowledge. So every time when you are doing finance and accounting and uh, any other work inside your company, you know, you have all these reports, all these procedures, all these charts hidden inside documents. What about creating one chart in your organization like this, showing exactly how much revenue, how much, uh, uh, how much re where your revenue is coming from, what are your expenses, where your expenses going to, what is your cycle, what's happening inside your organization in a really nice visual way. 
in that case we are as accountants and financial professionals communicating all this information to the whole organizations and making sure that everyone in our operation is understanding exactly what's happening in our company this is our role as accounting and financial and financial professionals you know we want to make sure that everyone will understand the financial and accounting aspect of their work so in that way they will help us and they will help the organization so by you know meeting any financial goals by uh, by uh, doing doing their budget for their department but without them having this clear picture sometimes they feel like you know they are just doing their own work and they don't care about what's happening in the organization so here I have another question. Just a second, let me open the question for you. And let's go to this question. Okay, and now the question is open. They can open it more. So this question is saying, a company has more cash today when account receivable increases, profit increases, customers pay their bill sooner, returned earnings increases. What is the answer? See here we are trying to test here your financial knowledge and financial information. Do you understand the foreign operation of a company, the cash aspect? Okay, let's see the results. So as we can see here from the result, most of you said the answer is C. Let's see if it's correct. Definitely, the answer is C. Customers pay their bill sooner. Remember, for us as a business, when we think about cash, what are we trying to say? We are trying to say when we have customers, and customers will pay our, you know, uh, when they pay their account receivable sooner. In that case, I will be able to have more cash in the business. As simple as that. Okay. Let's move on to uh, our next segment. So now we are saying for income statement, when we look at income statements, the question here, do you think, look, be careful here what I'm gonna say. Do you think, that this is how much net profit the company generated? Do you think this is how much sales they have? Do you think this is how much cost of, cost, uh, cost of goods sold they have on, in, 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 on their books? In another way, let me tell you that all the financial statements for your companies are fake numbers. And you'll be like, fake numbers? What do you mean? Like I will tell you, the total assets that you have inside your company is fake. It's not correct. And the total liabilities that you have in your company, at the same time, it's fake. The net revenue for your company for the coming, uh, for, the, uh, for last year in the, your financial statement is fake. And you'll be like, what do you mean by fake? I will say something like this. The first thing, how do you account for any expenses and revenue? Well, we say, how do you decide uh, who, uh, how you should account for uh, your expenses and revenue? Uh, no, no, it's not fit because of accrual. It's because of something else. I will tell you. We say the management, they decide how they are going to account for expenses and revenue. So let's say we have an expense related to research and development. The management, they can say, because of this and this and that, we are going to capitalize part of it and we are going to expense part, part of it. And how do they know? This is the question. How do they know that they sh should do it? They don't. They just guess. Because they say, based on the revenue recognition, do you know, we think that, you know, based on this and this and that and this and that, and they can justify saying, this is what we believe, it's, it's correct. And remember, do you know, that in accounting and finance, we don't have anything called accounting rules or regulations. We have always what? Guidelines, standards. So we don't have something that's, you know, completely coming directly from the government saying, this is what we need to do. It's just the standards and guidelines to help you in making your judgment decision. So as we can see, profit is an estimate. So when you go to a company and you see they are making a lot of money, actually it's an estimate. It's not the real money that they are making. So we say accountants 
had to make judgment decision when they record financial transactions. It's all judgment decisions. It's not the actual decisions. And financial managers need to make objective decisions based on uh, these numbers that they get from accountants. So think about this. Accountants, they are making all judgment decisions and saying this revenue, we should record it this way and this way. And they are making judgment decision. They can't say 100% uh, uh, are correct. Why? Go to five accountants and ask them the same question and they are going to give you five answers because they believe based on these, these, these criteria, this is, should be recorded in this way. And the other guys say no, but don't uh, forget about there is an exemption and there is a rule will contradict this rule and based on this and this it should be recorded in this way. So now I'm getting the financial report from my management and accountants saying that this is these are the financial numbers. And now I need to make objective decision based on subjective information. So in that way, you know, it's really difficult for me to make it without, see, without asking questions to these accountants saying, how did you come up with these numbers? Did you account for the revenue for the next quarter? They say, yes, we did. We'll be like, but how? They say, because we believe in this and this and this. And they'll be like, okay, now I at least understand that this financial information that they gave me is representing a revenue for this quarter and next quarter because certain consideration they had. As a financial manager, sometimes I can't you know, argue with them how they are doing the accounting. I'm just getting the report from them. And the least thing that I need to do, I need to understand you know, this report and this number are representing what. So accountants should give the most accurate picture of the company. But do they do that? You know, if you look at all these financial statements, I love just to read them. Look like at 90% of the financial statements, most of them, they report what? Profit. Most of them, they report great financial positions. Why? Because accountants, they are trying to do their best to do, to, to account for everything appropriately, but in a way that will make the company look much better than it is. It's, they are motivated by many factors. But what they do, in case they need to disclose some information, they just put them in the footnote, you know? In case they, they, there are certain issues that they don't agree on with the, uh, with the auditors, they just put them in the footnotes. And who is reading the footnotes? For you as financial managers, you are not going to the footnotes. For you, when you get financial reports, they don't give you additional disclosures. They just give you numbers. They just give you financial information, and you need to analyze it. So we say all financial decisions are based on judgment, and different methods can produce different results. For that, don't trust the numbers. We know uh, figures don't lie. Your job is to make them. So for accountants, this is their job. So in that way, make sure that you don't trust the numbers that they give you. You always ask questions. And it's very important to ask the right questions and make sure that you understand what the numbers are or understand or make sure that they are what you think they are. If you look at the expenses and you say, wow, this is the depreciation is not that much. They tell you, yes, but we changed our accounting you know, method related to depreciation. So for that, our depreciation got reduced. So you'll be like, ah, okay, now I understand, see? Without asking questions and saying, okay, why our depreciation is going down, you will not know that they changed the accounting uh, method related to depreciation. So always ask questions. We are saying there's always accounting judgment involved, and that can lead to manipulation. And manipulation can benefit the company, and it's not illegal, right? For me, if I change my accounting method, and as long as I disclose it, and as long as auditors are happy with it, and this will allow me to generate additional 20 million in profit for this year, no one can argue. It's completely legal. I can't change it back and forth, but as long as I change it in certain period from a method to another, and I keep with it, that's completely legal. But in one way or another, I was able to increase 20 million dollars in my profit. So just be careful. We are saying accountant change that is material to the bottom line should be footnoted. But who will decide if it's material or not? The accountants, right? If they change something and they think it's not material, unless the auditors will come back and attack them saying it's material, they will not report it. And at the same time, GAP, it's only providing guidelines. So this is what you need to rem remember. It's not providing you with full standards saying this is what you should do, this is what you should not. So it's not white and black, it's always in the gray area. So what questions are you going to ask? Before going to this, let me go over this. Cooking the financial books. We always say that accountants are cooking books. Accountants, they are like, do you know, the people who are cooking. They have the same skills. Why is that? 
Think about the last time you ordered pizza. The first thing that you look for is the ingredients. What are we going to include in this pizza? Are we going to get olives? Are we going to get pepperoni? Are we going to get sauce? See all these items that you are going to have in your pizza. So with accounting, it's the same thing. We have our revenue. I start thinking, should I include the revenue for this division? No, this is out. Should I include the revenue for this division? Yes. What about the revenue for last year? Should I include part of it that whatever, whatever happened to it? Yes. Maybe no. Should I include another revenue? So they will decide what they are going to include and what they are not going to include. So it's like making a pizza. Decide whatever it, you are going to have in it. And after that, they do estimates. They say, mm, from the revenue related to this division, we are just going to take 80% of it. We are going to say 20% is for next year. Why? Because, you know, the, na, 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 all these aspects. So for that, when they are preparing the accounting books, it's like they are making, you know, cooking a meal. They are deciding what ingredients to have and how much of each one of them. For that, we say, you need to ask questions for you to understand what are the ingredients and at the same time, how much they had in, in, in each one of them. So the first question, what were the assumptions in the number? You know, what assumptions you use? What revenue you include and you didn't include in your revenue uh, on the income statement? The second one, are there any estimates in the number? Did you estimate anything inside the numbers and you said, this is how much we estimated? And after that, what is the bias those assumptions and estimates led to? And finally, so what are the implications? So, okay, that's fine. This is what you included. This is what you didn't include. This is how much you included from each one. Okay, let's see. This is manipulated the financial statement in one way or another. Let's see how. And then let's see how much money you made out of it or what were the motives behind these changes. Once we ask these four questions, we will be able to really understand, you know, why we all the time saying today the government accountant cooking the books or the financial accountants are cooking the books because they can manipulate the numbers. And for you, before making decisions, you need to understand what they are doing. So the first thing that they can do, they can increase revenue right so they can say okay this is how much revenue we are going to have so in that way that will increase their net profit so for them to increase their bottom line net profit they can increase revenue or reduce expenses let's see xerox xerox sold equipment on four-year lease including service and maintenance and they booked all the revenue up front so xerox misled um, uh, you know investors and after that they misstated four years worth of profit resulting in about like you know overstating uh, their profit by six billion dollars and after that they got caught what about channel staffing do you know when companies by the end of the year they send empty boxes reporting it as revenue and completely legal because they sent the products but after that the product uh, the boxes would come back from the customer saying they are empty so we take them out from next year revenue now we go to reducing expenses, you know, for another way for us to reduce expenses is to play with what? With depreciation. In the income statement, when we look at what kind of expenses that's easy to manipulate, depreciation is number one. So what can happen? Like waste management. Waste management said, okay, we are buying all these companies. We don't know how to run them in, in the right way. We are not making money. So the uh, guys in uh, waste management said, okay, what are we going to do? We are not going to report profit for this year. One of them said, no, do you know, why don't we change the depreciation method of our 20,000 trucks and one and a half million dumpsters from 80 to 10 years to 12 to 15 years. And this will allow us to cut our depreciation expenses by, you know, huge amount. And in that case, it will appear that we are making profit for this quarter. So after they did this, the government discovered that and they had to take a pre-tax charge about one time right off of 3.5 billion against their earnings. These are not small numbers. Look, they were playing with depreciation and that resulted 3.5 billion. So it's a huge amount when you can, you know, just change the depreciation method. So the other question that I have here for you, just a second, let me open the question so you'll be able to answer it. So the question is open right now for you. So the question is, how, uh, which is more important? How much you make, how much you keep, 
how much you borrow or how much you spend. Think about it personally. Do you know if you think, okay, my personal life, what is more important? How much I make, how much I keep, how much I borrow, how much I spend. Okay, it looks like most of you voted. So let's see your answers. Wow, it looks like, you know, most of you said number B. And we have 30% saying number A, but I'm interested with these people who said 20% how much you spend, you know? Because like, I, I really don't care how much you spend. You can spend them on whatever you want. But the correct answer is, is number B, how much you keep. And you'll be like, why this is the correct answer? Do you know, it's interesting. I want to know. Well, think about if you are the CEO of Google. If you are the CEO of Google, you are making a lot of money. So how much you make, it's a lot. But you need to pay for your jet and you need to pay for all your other expenses. And at the end of the day, you will not end up with so much money. But if you say how much you spend, well, how much you spend, you can spend whatever you want. If you make a lot of money, you can spend a lot of money. So that's good. I don't really care. But the most important and critical for me is how much you keep. So here, when I'm reviewing a co company, I'm looking at debt net profit. I don't care if they have amazing revenue. At the end of the day, are they making profit out of this revenue after paying all their expenses? And then what I need to think about, I think to need, I need to think about cash. Are they turning this profit into cash? So look at this financial statement for this firm. What do you think about it? You know? This is a really great financial statement. What do you think about it when you take a look at it? Please write in the chat box. I'm just going to open the chat again for you. So please write in the chat box. What do you think about this company? Look at the financial statement. Think that you are working for this company and someone gave you a financial report saying, look, this is what's happening for us during the last five years. Do you have any comments? Would you, if you are working on the board of directors, give the CEO a bonus? Would you fire the CEO? What would you do? I'm waiting for your answer. One year of operation looks okay. One year, I, I'm I'm looking at 2000. What's happening in 2000? Do you think we should ask some questions? Yes, it looks like we have a great improvement in 2000. Okay, it looks like do you know cash flow? Something happening with cash flow? I agree with you. Maybe it looks like the revenue overstated. Completely, I agree with you. What about other thing? Good growth, right? But the profit looks like no, no, there, there, right? The profit. I completely agree with you. Uh, other comments. Cash from our activity has not improved. Exactly. Do you know when we look at the cash balances, what's happening with it? Asset really high. Asset, wow, they doubled their asset. What's happening there? Their revenue is moving up, their assets are moving up, but no operating income, no cash. What's going on with this firm? I wonder. You know, that would give me so many, to, for me to ask so many questions. What's happening here? So, if we do our analysis, look what we get to. We look at revenue and we say, wow, revenue is moving so much, but operating results is not moving that much. And after that, when we go and do more search, we discover this is the financial state statement for Enron, right? This is how Enron was representing their financial statement to their external auditors. And their external auditors are saying, there is nothing there. Everything looks fine. The numbers are amazing. <laughs> you know, we are going to go and certify on this statement and say that <laughs> they did a good job. The company is really improving. They are doing so much revenue. They improved their assets. 
and they are going to be the future of the business. But what happened to Enron? Enron just collapsed. Do you, do, you, do you remember? Enron was just a big disaster. So again, if we go, we just finished the income statement. If we go to balance sheet, you know, for the balance sheet, we have so many items that we can manipulate. If we start with assets, you know, what can we do with assets? We can capitalize expenses. So when we capitalize expenses, we need to understand, you know, exactly what expenses we are going to capitalize and what expenses we are going to uh, keep. So we say that, you know, for WordCom, they were capitalizing so many expenses related to their, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, normal expenses, which is the communication expenses. And that was a big disaster, about 3.8 billion. So this is one of, one, one of them. Uh, our uh, webinar, by the way, it, we are going to have about like uh, another uh, five to seven minutes before we finish. So, um, so another items that we, they can capitalize, goodwill, right? Goodwill, which is the amount, the price paid, less than the net price, which is asset less uh, equity, uh, less liability. This is the amount uh, that can generate goodwill for us. And goodwill, you know, currently, you don't need to amortize it. You just do environment for goodwill. So at the same time, companies, they can play with goodwill and they can, you know, increase their goodwill that they have in their uh, front. Especially now that goodwill or like, let's say, intangible assets is it's representing 30% of the market capitalization of most of the companies in the market. So an example like Tyco, what happened that they bought all these companies, they over, uh, you know, valued their goodwill and that generated higher profit. And after that, Tyco suffered from about like $9 billion losses from all these overstate goodwill. At the same time, another situation with Enron. Enron, they were playing on another line, on, on li their liability. So what they said, they said, as long as we don't have more than 50% ownership in the firms that we are working with, these firms, they can do all the borrowing. We will put all these liabilities and borrowing on our off-balance sheet statement and we will channel all this money to our operation. So in that case, we will be able to inflate our assets without having liability on the other side. So where is the truth here, if you would like to ask me? Well, it's simple as that. Cash is king. Warren Buffett said that. So when I need to examine, I need to understand that profit is not cash. Profit will be turned into cash, but sometimes we have a profit without cash, sometimes we have cash without profit. For that, we use accrual method. And for uh, me, I need to analyze the cash flow statement, the cash in and the cash out. So by looking at the financials and at the cash flow statement, I look at the operating activities, I look at the investing activities, and I look at the financing activities. And this will give me a really good indicator of what's happening in my operation. So the final question that we have for you today, and just a second, let me open it for you. We are going to have this question, and after that, we are going to close and get your questions. And here it's open. So if we are saying Jack is looking at Anne, but Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, but George is not. Is a married person looking at an unmarried person? I know some of you attended my presentations before, so they know the answers, you know, but I'm trying to to get most of you to, to understand what is the correct answer. So Jack is looking at Anne. And let me, you know, I, I would like to make it even easier for you. Let me see if I can here. Oh, look, what, what do you need uh, more than that? Now it's super, should super easy. Here Jack is looking at Anne and Anne is looking at George. Jack is married, do you know? But George is uh, not. What do you think is the answer? Okay, let me show you the result. Most of you said that, you know, it's what the answer is C. We can determine. But look, we can determine. The correct answer is A. And you'll be like, the correct answer is A? How come? How the correct answer is A? Look, as simple as this. Let me put the voting on the side. Let's assume that Anne is married. So in that way, a married person is looking at an unmarried person. Right? Okay, you say, yes, but we don't know. Okay, I'm assuming. Or let's assume that Anne is unmarried. 
So a married person is looking at unmarried person. So, so in these both situations, even we have no information about what's happening with Anne, we know that a married person is looking at unmarried person. So why I'm giving you this? Because when you are analyzing financial information, sometimes you think, okay, you can't see the big picture because you don't have enough information, you don't have enough data or reports. But actually, sometimes you will be able, just by the information that you have, to link the information together and be able to figure out what you are going to actually do. So the answer is yes, we can. So finally, what we, what we, uh, we want to do, for us as experts in finance and accounting, we should always understand that if we rely on our experience without using our mind, we will not expect new things, and for that we will miss them. We, will not, and we, we spend so much time looking at the details and we forget the big picture. This is a great thing. If you would like to acquire more information, this is a great book called Blink. You, you can read. And at the same time, while we might not have all the answers, we should always know what questions to ask. And this is the skills that we should acquire. We should acquire skills saying, okay, what kind of questions I need to ask for me to be able to obtain strategic financial decision making skills. This is some of the courses that I, I teach. I would like to thank you so much for attending this presentation. It was a pleasure, you know, uh, working with you for, uh, for it. And at the same time, I would like to thank the IMA the Dubai chapter for allowing me to do this uh, presentation for the members. Here is just the final question. If you would like just, you know, to rate the sessions based on whatever you think it's appropriate. Of course, we are not going to reveal these answers. It's just for the IMA. And um, if you have any more questions, please feel free in the chat box. I'm just going to move the chat box in a second here. So in that way, you can just, you know, write your questions and I will be more than happy to answer them for you. We uh, at Open Thinking, we conduct some courses related to managerial accounting for decision making, fraud examination and internal auditing. Uh, if you would like any more information, here's my contact information. I hope that you enjoyed this presentation. Uh, it's, it's like about an hour. And please, if you don't, if you didn't mention your full name, please write your full name in the chat box. So in that way, we will be able to accredit you with the CBE uh, credit. Thank you very much. I'm getting so many thanks, but no, not so much questions. I need questions, guys. I need you to 